Time to go. Time to go. Time to go. All right. Welcome. Good morning. Everybody sleep well? Yeah. All right. Good. Gosh, it must be early for you guys. Saturday morning. Cutting into some precious sleep time. <laughs> um, well, before we begin, um, are there any questions uh, about what we covered yesterday evening before we move on here? Anything we need to clarify? Okay, good. Well, what, what we'd like to do today is, is uh, take that information on general sprinting that we discussed yesterday afternoon and kind of now extend it to the hurdle clearance and the runs between the hurdles. And that's uh, what we're going to take a look at in some depth this morning. Again, as yesterday, <clears throat> don't hesitate to um, stop me, raise your hand, call my name, whatever you need to do to ask questions as we go. We'll try to address those things as, as we go rather than wait till the end. So <clears throat> in this part of the hurdle game, we want to take a look at the actual hurdle clearance um, and how that affects the run between the hurdles. So we're going to look at this action that every hurdler performs basically 10 times during the race. The approach run into the hurdle, the clearance of the hurdle, and the run off of the hurdle. Now we're going to take a look at each one of those steps and what's occurring. Uh, some, some big factors we need to recognize going into this is that hurdling obviously has a pretty high coordination requirement. And it's a tremendous factor in all events, but particularly in hurdling. Uh, fear of a hurdle can be a factor, too. If, if an athlete is introduced to the hurdles at a young age, and, and uh, as some of the factors we talked about yesterday, if the hurdles are too tall or they're too far apart, they can pretty quickly acquire this fear of hurdling, especially if an athlete's fallen in the hurdle race. Uh, that, that's something you have to try to control as much as possible during the teaching process so the athlete gains a confidence and, that, and the fear doesn't become something that, that uh, that overtakes them. I think it's probably a critical factor separating many good hurdlers from great hurdlers because when you're hurdling at, at world-class level, um, let me try to give you an example of what it feels like. You're, you're running at nighttime and you're hurdling in the dark and you really can't see the things, all you can do is kind of feel them. I mean, it, it, I always tell athletes, when you feel like you're on that edge of being out of control is when you're running well. So it's, uh, it, it takes a little bit of courage to run at those hurdles with uh, velocities over 8 meters per second. And there's a certain strength requirement to perform these movements. As we saw yesterday when we were looking at the sprinting mechanics and the ground contact times in the foot, there, uh, there's an elastic strength requirement there. And the, the stronger the athlete, the better they're able to perform this elongated stride, which we call the hurdle stride because it's a stride that's going to be up to three meters long. In some cases, maybe even a little longer. So that requires uh, a great deal of strength to perform that movement in a coordinated fashion without uh, having it appear to be a jump. <clears throat> a general objective for, for every hurdler, for every hurdle coach, is number one, to always try to improve your hurdling technique, your hurdling skill. Uh, regardless of what age group we're working on, and again, this, is this, this talk is mostly focused toward really elite level hurdling. But even at the very elite level, we're always trying to improve our hurdling skill. Every elite hurdler you see run in the World Championships or Olympic Games has some technical deficiencies. They can all become better at what they do. And for athletes at that level, in my opinion, that's really how you do become better. You try to improve your, your ground contact times. You try to improve your flight over the hurdle. You try to improve your run over the hurdle. And as we're going to see a little bit later, the most minuscule improvements can make dramatic changes in your time of your performance. Uh, beyond improving hurdling skill is maintaining the rhythm between the hurdles. So that the, the very fast rhythms that we have typically early in the race can be maintained throughout the middle of the race and, and late race. Much like a 100 meter sprinter wants to maintain their speed throughout the course of the entire distance. We need to develop a solid start and an aggressive acceleration through the first hurdle. It's not always the most important thing to be the, the first athlete to the first hurdle. Just like with a 100 meter sprinter, it's not always the most important thing to be the first athlete at 15 or 20 meters out. But if you're setting up your race to allow yourself to accelerate from that 
20 meter point to that 40 meter point and set yourself up to maintain good speed through the rest of the race, ultimately you could be the fastest athlete. Uh, we want to accelerate through more than one hurdle. As we saw yesterday in looking at the dynamics of acceleration, just like with the 100 meter sprinter who wants to accelerate up to maybe uh, 30 to 60 meters, we'd like to see a similar thing in the hurdles. And a very common error among many hurdlers is thinking they have to attain their top speed by the first hurdle and then just try to maintain that speed. We really want to think about accelerating beyond the first hurdle, up through three hurdles, four hurdles, even five hurdles, and then thinking about maintenance of speed from that point through the rest of the race. So those are some general objectives we want to look at and always keep in mind throughout our discussions today. When we look at that first component of hurdle scale, here are some components that, um, that are, are quite important. Number one, um, my bias is takeoff efficiency because I think what happens at the takeoff ultimately determines the entire race. And particularly what happens at takeoff at the first hurdle. Uh, this transition from the blocks through an eight step acceleration to taking off at the first hurdle is, is a difficult skill. It's one that, that has to be practiced a lot regardless of the level of the hurdler. Because if that is not a fluid movement uh, and an efficient movement, whatever problems we see at the first hurdle will be duplicated nine more times throughout the course of the race. Uh, step management. Uh, the length of steps between the hurdles. As we saw yesterday, the, length, the average length of our steps between the hurdles for women is somewhere around 1.9 meters, and that's less than, than the, their average step length if they were running on the flat, which is, in most cases, well over 2 meters. So managing the length of the steps becomes a challenge uh, at all performance levels. For the beginner hurdler, the challenge is one often of trying to reach the next hurdle. But the better the athlete gets, the more the challenge becomes of trying to get the steps in without getting too close to the next hurdle. So. The, the interesting thing about hurdle skill and step length is that the better hurdler you become, the more problems you create. It's an endless cycle. The faster I become, I, be, I create a problem of getting too close to the hurdle and having to manage that speed. So uh, if you're coaching hurdlers, you have to look at it as an interesting challenge that there's always going to be new problems. The better I do my job, the more problems I create. Just like government, right? All right, so when we look at takeoff efficiency, what we're trying to do here is minimize our loss of velocity or, or minimize those kinds of forces that we set up at the, in the two steps leading into the hurdle that are going to cause us to decelerate. Because any minor deceleration at the first hurdle is going to be increased at the second hurdle and again at the third hurdle. And you've all seen hurdlers that they look pretty good over two or three hurdles and then each hurdle after that becomes increasingly a bigger struggle or with what we see oftentimes with young hurdlers is they'll be able to take three steps from maybe two hurdles and then they go to four steps and eventually they go to five steps or they end up bounding between the hurdles. And that's a result of what happens at the takeoff. Uh, it, it requires an aggressive approach to the hurdle. Uh, by keeping your approach to the hurdle takeoff aggressive, it helps you maintain step frequency. Okay, there's no pause there for decision making about how I'm going to take this hurdle or what leg I'm going to take it with in, in the case of long hurdle events. So it helps to maintain our step frequency. When we take a look at what's happening here in this video, and I'm going to slow it down for you a little bit. Now, what happened to my player here? We can see how this, the, the hurdler on this side is starting to set up her takeoff. And that the foot's way out in front. It looks like she's going to almost strike on her heel. And then we look at that point at which we examined yesterday where they're in full support. And we see that her right knee here, there's a gap between the knees. So this is going to increase the ground contact time here tremendously and result in probably a, a big swing of that right leg forward which is going to launch her up into the air and increase her, her air time. So
So that's not a very good example of an efficient takeoff. Um, and we're going to look at later in the talk about why that's occurring. Now this is a start to the first hurdle. And uh, this is not an uncommon thing. The athlete realizes I'm going to be a little far away from the hurdle, so they tend to reach a little bit. And that's the one thing we really want to try to avoid is any reaching or any chopping motions as we approach this takeoff. When we look at the actual anatomy of what's going on in a takeoff, I want you to consider the penultimate step as having an equal or greater importance than the actual takeoff step itself. Uh, and again, I'm going to illustrate what I mean here in, in much more detail. That penultimate step, much as the penultimate step in a jumping event, transfers the energy through the takeoff and allows the takeoff mechanism to be what we want it to be. So we have to think about when we see problems over a hurdle or problems that, uh, that an athlete's having as they clear the hurdle or land on the, on the other side of the hurdle, the way to fix that is to go back and look at the two steps leading into that hurdle. And almost always that's where you'll find the solution to your problem. When we see problems in the air, regardless of what kind of an event it is, always go back and look at what happened on the ground because the problem was created on the ground. What we see in the air is only a result of the kinds of forces that were created on the ground. So if we set up this penultimate step correctly, it's going to largely determine the path that our center of mass takes through this hurdle, whether it's a high path, whether it's a path low through the hurdle, or whether it's a path that uh, takes some other direction. So when we're looking at the takeoff, we have to look at posture. We want to have a nice upright posture, just like we do in sprinting. We have to look at what's happening in the movement of the pelvis, the feet, the thighs, and the kinds of forces we're creating. When I look at a hurdle or move through a hurdle, and I want you just to look at her hips here for, the, for, the, for a few minutes, I want to see the velocity of that hip basically just be maintained as she approaches the hurdle and she moves through the hurdle. When you see an athlete can maintain their hip velocity through the hurdle, that's something pretty special. They figure some things out. A lot of times you'll see that hip velocity slow down a little bit and then take off again. But if we can maintain the velocity of that hip through throughout the last two steps and through the hurdle, then that athlete's well on their way to accomplishing some pretty good things. So when we're looking at this, again, posture is important. Posture should be upright. You're going to see a little bit of forward lean as we go into the hurdle, but that's, that's pretty common. But the run between the hurdles should have an upright posture, just like in sprinting. We want to see the hips over our feet and upward facing. We don't want to see the hips facing down and the buttocks behind us. Uh, feet under the center of mass, just like in sprinting. Every time that foot comes down, we want to see the foot underneath the hips. So we're, what we're doing is we're producing sprint-like forces utilizing those extension and stumble reflexes as we described yesterday. We're going to take a look at a somewhat undesirable model here. Uh, this is a novice hurdler. Uh, she's really a long jumper that uh, decided to take up the hurdles. And we're going to see a lot of the things here with respect to how she approaches her takeoff and sets it up that we're going to we're going to be problematic. Okay, first thing we see is there's there's foot contact there, and it's quite a bit in front of the center of mass. So when she's when she gets onto that ground there, what we're seeing is a lot of a lot of slack in the system. And those of you that were with me yesterday understand what I mean by slack. We've got an extreme dorsiflexion here in the ankle. The ankle's not rigid at all. And as a result of the slack in that ankle, we've got a lot of bend and slack in the knee, and more bend and slack here in the, in the uh, hips. We've got this almost s shape type curve. And what's happening then is that athlete's, this athlete's going to have a lot of time on the ground generating the forces needed to clear the hurdle. Okay, nice split of the thighs here, but 
instead of this, the whole action of this lead leg being at the hurdle, as a result of the long ground time here, and waiting for this leg to swing through, the action is becoming actually very high. So she's projecting herself much as you would expect. She's a long jumper. She's projecting herself like a long jumper. And so as a result, she's going to get quite a high clearance over the hurdle. And though that didn't look real bad, by the time that athlete does that 10 times in the course of the race, it's going to hurt her time quite a bit. So again, we're kind of back to the elements we talked about yesterday. When there's slack in the system, you lose posture, and you get a misdirection of the forces when they're applied to the ground. And that affects the quality of the clearance. Now this is a little better picture of a more desirable model. Posture is good. We see as this athlete runs into the hurdle, there's pretty good rigidity in that ankle as it's coming to the ground. The foot's underneath the center of mass. We don't have a perfect 90 degree angle with our camera here, but we see that that ankle stays rigid. Let's go back and look at this. This is going to be the penultimate step. The ankle's pretty rigid, it doesn't collapse. You see how the heel comes off the ground, that ankle's staying rigid, the heel comes off the ground. So that helps her to utilize her hamstrings and hips to transfer. As we come into the takeoff foot here, we get plantar flexion there. Again, the knees are together. Posture's tall. And the lead leg, knee and thigh are driven at the hurdle rather than up high over the hurdle. Limb movements are pretty clean as well. Any questions about limb movements or limb positions as we clear the hurdle? Okay. Again, with women's hurdling, we're trying to deviate as little as possible from sprinting. I had a couple, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this than I planned because I had some questions yesterday after the session re with respect to some limb positions here. And I'm just going to tell you what I'm looking for here. Again, you've probably noticed already I, I tend to focus a lot on what's happening on the ground, foot positions, these kinds of things, setting up the right kinds of forces. I haven't talked too much about what the limbs are doing. Uh, Basically, because it's my belief that if we do the right kinds of things in terms of setting up the foot and the ankle for the kinds of forces we want to produce here, that we're going to maintain a good posture. And when you maintain a good posture, a lot of these other things we see with respect to where arms and legs are going kind of self-correct. But what I want to see in this lead arm, well, it's the, it'll be the lead arm now, but it becomes a trail arm, is I basically want to see that arm go forward. So if I'm leading with my left leg, my left knee is coming up under the hurdle. I want to see the left elbow do a very similar movement. So all I'm really concerned about is what the elbow is doing. I want the elbow to move forward and high in parallel with this thigh and this knee. So thigh parallel to the upper arm. This hand, this lower arm, it can be here, it can be here. I really don't care. But I want to see the elbow moving in that direction. So that's what we're trying to emphasize here. Oops. So we see that high elbow, high left knee. The knee's driven that to the hurdle, driven to the hurdle. And not until the athlete leaves the ground do we really start seeing that lower leg begin to open up. This begins to open up at the knee. Now, one thing, there is some stylistic variability here. Once this knee is up and this elbow is up and I'm clearing the hurdle, I like to try to see this elbow stay up. 
I'd like to see more of this kind of an action rather than dropping that arm. But there's good hurdlers that do it in a variety of ways in that range of motion. So that's really a question of style and what they can do without creating a lot of twists in their shoulders. I think with young athletes, if we try to keep, get them to keep their arm up like they're, they're not strong enough in the core to yeah. maintain their body position square to the hurdle. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that's, that's, that's a good point. It's an individual thing. You have to coach what works. Also, the mass, the mass of the thigh will vary from individual to individual. If they've got a very large, massive thigh, then the, the, the force is created by the rotation of that thigh around. Something has to counter that, so the arm may need to be wider in order to counter that to keep the shoulders from twisting. Uh, I prefer to keep a bend in this lead leg. I think it's more efficient. It's less stressful on the hamstring as well. Uh, so you may see a momentary straightening of that lead leg, but as soon as the athlete feels that their, that their foot has crossed the hurdle, it's time to bring the leg down. The height of the parabolic path is right here. That's as high as her hips are going to be. They're going to start dropping off of the hurdle at this point. Now a very common error you will see among some hurdlers is this foot being higher than the knee. Okay, how many have seen that? Okay, that's a typical thing that you see when an athlete is jumping the hurdle. They're not running off of the ground. They're not, what I say, they're not leaving that leg back and trying to finish a little bit of a push off the ground there. They're jumping off the ground, and as a result, the, the jump flips the foot up like this. And so you get the foot higher than the knee. The knee will typically be the thing to come in contact with the hurdle. Or if it doesn't come in contact with the hurdle, you'll start to develop some soreness on the inside of your knee from that twisting motion. So if I see that... <clears throat> What I will cue the athlete to do to try to fix that <clears throat> is go back and tell them, <clears throat> as I'm leaving the ground here, don't be in a hurry to pull the trail leg through. Let the trail leg just kind of stay back there a little bit. Because after all, what Isaac Newton told us a long time ago is that for every action, there's an op equal and opposite reaction once we're in the air. So that trail leg really can't come through until this lead leg starts to drop. So at this point that the lead leg begins to drop down, then that trail leg can come through. So trying to advance the trail leg too soon before the lead leg has a chance to, to come through, you'll see the athlete kind of often just kind of bunched up over the hurdle. The tendency to hit the hurdle with the trail leg is dramatically increased as well. So just being a little bit patient there, waiting for things to happen. So the, the, the type of rhythm I often, or a type of cue I'll use with Perdita often is that wait at takeoff, you wait, and then you hurry, and then you wait for the hurdle, and then you hurry. Waiting for that action to complete itself. Well, if we're looking for the idea of what sets up a good hurdle clearance, I think first and foremost, good sprint mechanics uh, and good coordination to produce good ground forces. So getting back to the ground forces, let's look at where it all begins. I want to take a look at some varying degrees of, of, of ground force production. We're just going to use a simple, what I call a stiffness jump. Um, this athlete just jumps off, jumped off of that box and they're just trying to produce some, some short jumps. Now. They don't look too bad, do they? You know, in, in full speed here. But when we take a look at this and we slow it down, we see as the athlete enters the ground, let's go on to the next jump here. Good foot dorsiflexion there. The feet are prepared to put force on the ground, but look at the Look at the extremely early plantar flexion. She's not even on the ground yet, and her feet are extremely plantar flexed. So only one thing can occur there, is that that athlete's going to have to wait for a lot of amortization, a lot of slack in the system. See all that slack, that long time on the ground? A lot of bend at the knee, a lot of bend at the ankle, 
and then she's able to jump again. So this is just an example of, of poor timing. And the poor timing of that plantar flexion into the ground creates the slack in the system. And I use exercises like this in the beginning to teach athletes this whole concept of slack. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have a timing mat where I can actually put a timing mat underneath their feet and I can measure the time they're on the ground. And what the interesting thing is, is that not only can we measure the timing, we can measure the height of the jump. <clears throat> when there's slack in the system, I show them the amount of time they're on the ground that when it's longer, the jumps feel like more work and the jumps are actually lower. But when they have a real rigid system, their time on the mat is less, the jump is less effort, and the jump is higher. You do that single foot as well? Um, not too much single foot. I, I, I'll, I'll, when I'm teaching someone this concept, I'll do it try mostly double foot because you, it's, it's a little more dramatic. You can see it and feel a little easier. But yeah, you could do it single foot as well. But then once the athlete feels what that's supposed to be like in terms of, of effortless, the timing, the greater height they get, then they start to get the kinesthetic sense of what it's like to apply forces that are better quality, less effort, and um, they learn what the timing feels like. So I can, use, I can do some jumps like this, get the timing right, and then send them on a sprint down the track and say, now I want you to replicate that on every step. Feel it. Feel it. Here's an example of a little better ground forces. The lever positions are good on the ankle. There's a little less slack. But it's still, still not ideal. We slow it down here. Still a little more plantar flexion earlier than I would want. But not, not as much slack time as we had with the previous jumper. This is what I'm more like what I'm looking for. Better stiffness in the joints, reduced slack in the muscles. This is the type of energy that we want to see created in our takeoffs and all in all of our sprinting steps. The toes stay up, they're up, they're up, they're up, they're up, and then right at the last second, they tap into the ground. And the great thing about this is that when you produce your locomotive energy utilizing these elastic systems, is that this, this is free energy. The one event group that would improve their performance the most dramatically of all, any event in track and field would be distance running if they started to embrace this concept a little more. They, athletes running 420 in the 1500 meters could cut 10 seconds off their time just by improving this one concept. Because this, this requires no energy. You're, just letting the t you're setting up the, the muscular system to allow the tendons to do the work. So, taking that basic two-footed tapping motion, or I call it a stiffness jump, we take that and we put a, use it to develop a basic ankle coordination exercise. And we'll get to do this on the track a little later. So what we see here, let's look at the bottom one first, okay. What we've done is we've taken the, 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 the exercise we had previously, we've We've alternated the feet a little bit. We've got a lead foot and we've got a back foot. So instead of the feet being together, we have the feet coming down 
and we're trying to do the same type of jump. But what the rear foot is doing is basically just really tapping the ground very quickly and following that with a very quick and forward motion of the free leg. Okay, so what the athlete's doing here is they're acquiring that kinesthetic sense of I'm going to hit the ground with a good stiffness in my ankle, get off of it, and the, that free knee is moving forward really quickly. We're just learning the ankle coordination, or the coordination of those forces. So again, we're looking at all the same elements we've talked about before. Tall posture. Everything's underneath the hips. Stiffness in the system. Setting up the gastrox and hamstrings to allow that foot when it hits the ground to produce a high force real quickly. And that's going to be our basic movement. And from that basic movement we'll take it a step further. And what we've done here is this, is what to relate this to hurdling, what's happening here is the right leg is the lead leg. So it becomes penultimate step, takeoff step. <coughs> penultimate step, takeoff step, and hold a position. Penultimate step, takeoff step. And if you really look at this, all it is is the previous exercise with a little bit range, bigger range of motion. A little more emphasis on single support than double support, but it's the same rhythm. Instead of pump, 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 it's now pump, 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 pump. And again, this, the emphasis is the same. In real time speed. You'll see, if you look at the right ankle, you don't see any collapsing. And what she's trying to do is maintain that dorsiflex position until right before the, the foot gets to the track, and then tap it into the track, tighten the gastroc muscle, allow the tendon to do its job, and then follow it with a very fast reaction of the lead leg to its lead leg position. Would you do that with both sides? Yeah, you can do it with both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what I'm specifically working on, a hurdle takeoff, though, I'll, t I'll tend to just emphasize it on the one side. So, it, I'm trying to follow a, 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 a sequence here. We started with that basic exercise. We changed it to a little more hurdle-specific movement. And this is a little more specific in the sense of we're going to focus on the energy transfer off of that penultimate step in a rhythm and in a velocity that's real similar to what we're doing in the hurdles. So what I'm having the athlete do here is use an eight-step approach, just like we would in the hurdle, acceleration. In the last two steps, we're going to simulate the same kind of action. So there's hurdle six, step six. Step seven is the penultimate. Emphasis on down from above, keeping the shank perpendicular to the ground, Forces coming down from above, rigidity in the ankle, quick advancement of the knee forward. She's barely on the ground now, not quite. There we're in full support. Posture's a little more forward than I want, but again, the emphasis here is on the dynamics of what's happening on the ground and the ankle. Again, for those of you that may not have been with me yesterday, these are just these mats are maybe three to five centimeters high. This set of mats is maybe another one or two centimeters higher. There's really no significance to that other than the fact that when, a mat, when there's a mat there, the athlete has to think about stepping down onto something. So 
it's easier for me to cue this stepping down onto type of concept. So this is going to be the lead leg. She's on her lead leg now. Rigid ankle. Now very quick scissor action. We're in support. Knees are together. Posture's tall. That's what I want to see on the takeoff step in the hurdle. Can't emphasize that enough. These knees have to be together. They have to be together. And that should happen if the foot is, if, if the sprinting mechanics are good, the foot's going to be underneath the center of mass. We can draw a line right through her body from her ankle to her head. And now we just, <laughs> then we just take off like a hurdle, take off, land into a sand pit. Well, let's take a look at that same exercise and look at some different qualities of what, what is essentially an extension reflex, this extension reflex off of the ground. I have three different athletes here. All three of them are very elite hurdlers doing the same exercise. Two Canadians, one American. The American's the worst one. Okay, again, we see pretty good. Uh, this athlete probably dorsiflexes in her support position more than the others. You see this pretty extreme dorsiflexion. Of course, she wears about a size 14 shoe. That's going to be on tape, isn't it? <laughs> it is on tape. <laughs> but anyway, so we, we get a little more collapsing there than we probably want. But mechanically, she keeps it rigid there coming off, and when we get to the point of takeoff, the posture's pretty good. Lean back a little bit, but the posture's pretty good, and the knees are, I think, acceptable. You know, Not as good as we saw with Perdita a while ago, but not bad. Here's another example, okay? And here's an example of timing that's anticipated too early. See the plantar flexion going into the step there? Now this is an athlete, she's always had a history of plantar flexion ever since I started working with her. It's something we're continually working on, and it really showed up here. The shank is good here. If she could keep that toe up a little bit more and wait just a fraction of a second longer before putting that, foot into the, that toe into the ground, she, the quality of the force she would get would be much better. Yes? But when, and when you slow it down, the heel comes down slightly, but it's not a heel toe. Like, um. Right, it's, it's, it's by, by plantar flexing at the last second, right. we use the gastrox, we shorten the gastrox, so that, that then ensures that, if, that by keeping this ankle rigid, right. the tendon's going to do the work. Oh, okay. Okay, okay now there, there is going to be some heel contact, but the ankle, what you'll see is the ankle, st when the ankle stays rigid, and when I show Perdita's picture, we'll look at this again. The ankle stays rigid, so after that heel contact, we come across and the ankle is still rigid. So we're, we're minimizing that time on the ground. When we see this plantar flexion here, we still see the heel come down, but again, you see the heel's coming right off. So there's, there's pretty good rigidity in that ankle still. But that was just, this, she was a good example of just poor timing. And you say, well, okay, that might not be a big deal. Well, let's put it in this context. If that athlete spends one more video field on the ground than her opponents, that's 16 thousandths of a second. Multiply that times 10, that's 16 hundredths of a second. That could be a difference between 1260 and 1253 which when you look at it in that perspective is huge. It's huge at the elite level. So every time we can eliminate a video field on the ground, we want to do it. And we see a similar thing here, a little bit too much plantar flexion. If she kept that toe up a little longer and allowed that foot to come underneath her center of mass, we're going to see she would have a better 
positioning of her knees at takeoff. And this is typically what I see in her hurdling too. This athlete's faster than Perdita Felician. In a 30 meters and a 60 meters and 100 meters, she'll blow Perdita off the track. But it's these mechanical things that are preventing her from being a faster hurdler right now. No, not really. Mm -mm. She looks. She looks like she's a little longer in the legs, probably, but not taller. Well, they were just a year apart. This girl was the NCAA champion in nineteen in two thousand four, and Perdita was the NCAA champion in two thousand three. Um, but I guess the reason I'm showing you these things is just to help illustrate how, regardless of what exercises we're doing or we choose to use. If, if we're real particular about the force-time relationships on how they express their forces in the exercises, then we can start to see some dramatic improvements. Okay, here again is a Perdita's really good ankle position. And what I like the most is where that free leg knee is. It's ahead. When she gets the full support, it's way ahead. Now, again, her posture is not what I would li ideally like here, but I think it's because she's looking down at the mats trying to figure out where she's going to step. But you notice when, when that ankle is rigid, you don't get a full extension here in the knee when she comes off of that. We don't want that. The force is already produced. The forces are done. And at, at this point, when that toe is coming off, the emphasis is totally on advancing this leg forward as fast as she can. That's her lead leg. She wants to advance that lead leg quickly, very quickly. So again, at full support, we see that right knee is ahead of the left knee. And again, it's my conjecture that this is what the great ones are doing, that the good ones aren't. They'll be able to time up this position of these knees so that that free leg is not only even with the support leg, it's slightly ahead of it. That means her energy transport is extremely efficient. So she's transporting her energy into the hurdle. So, <coughs> just look at these. Look at the athlete's hips. Follow their hips as they do the exercise. See if you can see some differences. It's subtle. A little bit of deceleration there. A little bit of down and up movement here. This one's going to be pretty smooth right through. Okay, I need to move on. So, if you remember the sequence we did we, with the basic jumping, we did a little harness exercise, we did the jumps off of the, the reflex exercise off of the mats. Now, as soon as I do that off of the mats, we go to the hurdle. And what we're trying to do here in the hurdle clearance is exactly the same thing. I tell them, you've come off of the mats, you felt that set up on the penultimate step, I want you to come over here to the hurdle and do exactly the same thing. So uh, we're, doing it, we're doing it without the mats, but it's the same exercise, and we're trying to feel the same things, the same ground forces, clearing one hurdle. I think it's real important when we, take, when we do exercises that we try to relate it to the event as soon as we can in some way. Relate that exercise, relate that feeling to the actual performance of the event. Because I don't, want, I don't want an athlete to think of drills as something we do over here and hurdling as something we do over here. I want them to relate every drill we do to something that relates to the performance of the hurdling itself. Because I always tell my athletes, if I give you an exercise to do and you ask me why and I can't give you a good answer, well, then don't do it, because it has no meaning. So, 
we come off of those other exercises and we go right into the hurdling and then try to relate the exercise to the hurdle performance. So what we're looking at here, and I'm not going to take time to count the video fields for you, but on these last three steps, up here we have, she's sending, spending seven video fields, seven video fields, and actually only six video fields on her last step which is really unusual, but it's really efficient. <coughs> this is the other girl we talked about with the large plantar flexion problems. She's going seven fields, seven fields, and seven fields. And that's not bad, but again, the one field difference is going to be sixteen hundredths of a second difference in their hurdle performance in a race. Can you see what, what you there? Well, a video field, um, I'll show you here. Whoop! Stop! Computer's got its own mind. Okay. When we, when we do videotape, typically in this hemisphere, we get 30 frames per second. Each of those frames consists of two video fields. If we can capture our video, if we've got a video capture device on our computer that can capture all 60 fields, and we can look at 60 individual fields of video, which is a little more finite than just the 30 frames. That's what this is. This video is six, can, we can see all 60 fields. So every time there's a movement, okay, so her foot is dent one, two, she's in support, so that's one field, two fields, three, four, five, six, seven, and she's off the ground. So that's what I mean by a video, video field or if you can't capture all fields with your computer, then at least you can catch the frames. You just won't have as many finite frames. So something like seven fields is going to be like three and a half frames. And you can do some basic biomechanics and measurement on your own to determine how long they're on the ground. So the purpose of this slide was, was strictly to show that just these minute little things, if we can start correcting force application times, improving on those, that it can have a big impact. Uh, and the impact could even be bigger than, than the, the time that I described because not, what happens when I become more efficient on every hurdle clearance, not only do I gain the time on that hurdle clearance, but I'm going to gain some time through less lo velocity loss between the hurdles as well. So the implications for these little things can become really big. So in this example, we see she's got a good, good setup, good takeoff. This is the penultimate step, or what's going to be the lead leg. Notice it comes down from above, down from above, knees ahead in full support. One, two, three, four, five, six fields, and she's off the ground. That foot's planted a little bit early, that toe planted a little bit early on that. One, two, three, four, five, six. We want that lead leg to move to the hurdle with the knee moving linearly. So we don't want to see a lot of this. I want to see the knee move to the hurdle, move right to the hurdle. And when we're looking at the athlete from the front, on that lead leg side, I want to see the hip rising. The hip on that lead leg side should be rising. Just like we talked about in the sprinting yesterday, okay? When I'm in support here, I want this free side rising. I don't want the free side drooping. I want it rising. So again, we talked about this yesterday. The step lengths are largely determined. Uh, I've mentioned a couple times already that we've got very specialized running here. When we look at the step off of the hurdle, this is a step that we want to try to control our step length. So we're landing on our, our lead leg touches the ground. 
The better your hurdler becomes, the more you want to control this step length. This is the shortest step in the three-step sequence. Or sometimes it's called the getaway stride. Uh, we're not really seeking displacement. We're seeking to get the foot down to the track as fast as possible. If this stride becomes too long, then the athlete's typically going to get, going to get too close to the next hurdle. So, as the athlete becomes better and better at their hurdling, this is the step we start paying more and more attention to. Because a young hurdler may actually reach with that, with that trail leg and try to eat up a little bit of ground in order to help them make the next hurdle. But as they get better and faster, then we have to start to shorten that step. Because that's really the only one we can play with very much. We have trouble with, uh, when you're teaching that, with the athlete dropping their knee prematurely in their clearance with their trail leg to get their foot to the ground? No, I, I really don't. I have, haven't experienced that too much. Um, no. Yeah. I mean, I, when I teach the trail leg, I really like to get that trail leg up into here and then the step down. Maybe that's why I haven't experienced it too much. I know I have seen athletes that come across the hurdle and just kind of do this. <laughs> Somebody's getting called out here. Okay, if we look at the middle step, this will be the next step coming off that previous step. This is going to be the next to the longest step in the sequence. This stride's typically around two meters in length. So again, it's another one of those strides that is initiated by the takeoff leg for the hurdle. So this, in this case, her left leg. That's going to be the longest step in the sequence other than the hurdle step itself. And what we're seeking here is we're seeking a nice, powerful movement. Okay, again, this left leg is the trail leg, came, came off the hurdle. We're trying to really push off of that leg then and really drive and, and maintain our velocity going into this penultimate step. This is the penultimate step right here. And we've looked at that penultimate step quite a bit already, so I won't need to spend a lot of time on it. Again, just like we saw in all the exercises a while ago, this is the step that really helps maintain velocity and transfers energy into the takeoff step itself. And again, emphasizing this whole aspect of trying to step down from above, create the energy. So again, as we look at this inner hurdle run, we have varying strides being produced on each step, the length of the strides that is, but the running posture is tall, Foot plants are underneath the center of mass. And we're doing everything we can to transfer energy, to maintain our velocity, not to do anything that's going to cause us to slow down or have to put any braking forces in. <clears throat> we don't necessarily always have to hurdle to train for that run between the hurdles. Um, just like with my sprinters, we'll do flying 30 meter runs with our hurdlers. Except when I do a flying 30 meter run with my, with my hurdle athletes, I want them to run with step lengths that are very similar to what they're going to use in the hurdle race itself. So this is an example of, this is Perdita doing a 30 meter fly run. I want her to do that in 15 and a half steps. 15 and a half steps gives me a stride length about what I'm going to be using between the hurdles. So what she's learning to do is to run fast, utilizing the kites of stride lengths that they're going to be mandated by her event. So if you count the steps here, fortunately she hits the first, the first cone or the first line with, she's right on the step here, right on the line. So 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and the 16th is over the line. So it's about right. How tall is Brady? Short. <laughs> She's a stump. 5'3", uh, 5'4", five, five, maybe. Yeah. But uh, the interesting thing is that, is that in measuring some 30-meter flies, that sometimes I think she's run her fastest 30s running this way as opposed to just a regular all-out run. So, but I think that's important, especially during the competitive season when you're doing overspeed work or high-velocity, maximal speed work, is with, with a spe hurdle, hurdle specialist, try to get them to do it with step lengths that are real similar to what they're going to be using in race situations. So we can train for the run between the hurdles without actually doing the hurdling. So with the men, we could do the same thing? Like <clears throat> yeah. Or mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Do the same kind of thing. So they're learning how to... Basically, they're learning a specialized sprint. Yeah. Hurdle rhythm. <clears throat> um, you have to plan for developing that rhythm. Uh, we have to educate the athlete what that rhythm feels like. We have to challenge the rhythm. I like this concept. Uh, it came from a French coach. I heard it well back in the 80s. He, he talked about 11 accelerations. It's always stuck in my mind because that's really what hurdling is. It's 11 accelerations. Every time you come off the hurdle, you're trying to challenge yourself to go faster. Because if you don't challenge yourself to go faster, you get caught up in this dump, dump, dump rhythm, dump, dump, dump rhythm, and it never changes. So you're always trying to run faster between the next two hurdles than you ran between the previous two hurdles. That's got to be your mental makeup. That's what you have to think about. And then rhythmic units are touchdown times. <clears throat> the great thing about this event is we can use touchdown times. They're easy to take measurements and we can take lots of measurements in training as well as in competitions. <clears throat> so this rhythm development involves both our step length and our step frequency. Uh, the important thing about it is that we have to control our takeoff and our touchdown times. So even when we're doing exercises to challenge the speed at which we're running between the hurdles, I typically like to put cones or markers at the takeoff point and at the touchdown point and make sure that we're still hitting those markers. Because if you start to run faster between the hurdles, the tendency is to start taking off closer to the hurdle. Per man? Hmm? Distances per man? The distances for men, you want to know what they are? Yeah. Oh, uh, this takeoff's going to be over two meters, 210, 220 probably, and the touchdown's going to be a well over a meter. Because the height of the hurdle is higher, their parabolic curve is longer. Yeah. So we, we want to make sure we're controlling those takeoff and touchdown distances. I think that, uh, that the rhythm training has to occur at the desired step frequencies we want. Uh, and so because of that, you have to adapt hurdle spacings. Um, moving the hurdles closer together and having the athlete run it through the hurdle event at high velocity mandates that the frequency has to be fast. So uh, the other thing you can use to your advantage here is if you get wind. I get the wind blows at my place all the time. So we line up all of our hurdle rhythm work with the wind to our back and it just blows us through it at that really high speed. So the athlete starts to adapt to what it feels like to run one second between the hurdles or .93 between the hurdles, whatever your goal is. They get used to what that feels like. And at the same time, we're maintaining a consistent takeoff and a touchdown distance. Now here's an example of a rhythm run. If you've got a, a training partner, these are ideal, but this is a, this is a run over nine hurdles. <coughs> These hurdles are, uh, I think these hurdles were spaced at um, 8.2 meters. That's a pretty typical spacing that I will utilize, 30 centimeters less on every hurdle. And when I do an exercise, have athletes do an exercise like this, I'll take the touchdowns off of video or I'll take the touchdowns actually at the track and we'll keep records on all of that information. Like this. I've got a database that I, I keep all of these things in. So I can, I can look at what their touchdowns are, the date they ran the exercise, what the exercise was. This was nine hurdles spaced at eight meters, 20, 13 meters to the first hurdle, 30 inch hurdle height. 
Now, typically for a lot of rhythm work, we'll do hurdle, hurdle heights that are a little less than, than competition height, but not always. In Perdita's situation, as she's become older, she likes to do more of it at 33 inches. Reason being is at 30 inches, she gets sloppy technically. Technically, she looks the best over 36 inch hurdles. Superb. But we race at 33. So we tend to do more of our rhythm work over 33s now. But what I'm looking for in this rhythm work is a consistency of touchdowns throughout the course of the, of the run. I don't want to see too much fall off at the end compared to what we were doing at the beginning. Another chart. These are, these are eight, eight hurdle runs. Okay, this is the kind of thing I want to see right here. You expect the first touchdowns to be a little slower because we're still accelerating, but 102, and then we get into this 96, 97, 97, 96, 96. That's what I want to see, that consistency all the way through eight hurdles. That tells me that athlete's pretty fit. They're pretty ready to run well. Hmm? I could take them off a of video or I'll, I'll just take them with a hand. I mean, it's, your hand times are pretty accurate because every time the foot hits the ground, you just take it a split with your touchdown. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite exercises in, in about mid to late competitive season is our 12 hurdle rhythm endurance runs. And if you can maintain a consistency in your hurdle touchdowns over 12 hurdles, it's actually a pretty good predictor of what you're capable of running in competition. Again, those are about 8 meters 20 apart. I discount them about 30 centimeters. Depending on wind conditions, if I've got really strong winds, maybe I won't do it as much. If it's a calm day, then typically 8 meters 20. And I keep lots of records on these 12 hurdle runs. I mean, this isn't bad. A 102, one flat, one flat for the 11th and 12th hurdle. That's still pretty darn good. Uh, but here's typically what I'm not looking for. Big drop-offs like 106 and 106 on the last two. Okay. So if I start to get those and it just tells me we need to spend a little bit more time doing this kind of work. Um, typically in this exercise, over the last about 15 years I've been doing this, that if we're doing this mid to late competitive season, I can take five to six tenths of a second off of this time. This is just a hand time. Five to six tenths of a second off of that, and that's what they're capable of running in competition. That's, and that holds pretty true. So I like this as a predictor of what, our, of what our race fitness is. So, again, once I've established a consistency with that rhythm work, then I want to challenge that consistency, okay? I know we're able to run at a, at a good clip, at a good velocity, consistently for 10 or 12 hurdles, then, well, okay, what can we do to get better now? We've got to try to reduce the, the time on those rhythmic units. Say we're running 0 0.96, 0 0.97, 0 0.98. I want to now run 0 0.95, 0 0.96, 0 0.95. So we'll do something like three steps and five step combos. And what this is, is she's running five fast competitive steps for two hurdles, and then we switch it to three steps. And what the five-step work does, it allows you to get your velocity up to a higher level, okay? It's like running downhill and then suddenly after a three-step hurdle. So it forces the athlete to um, take those three steps at a little faster velocity. Spacing for the five-step? Spacing for the five steps. For the women, I use about 11 and a half to 12 meters. 12 meters is probably closer to the ideal. But if I, want to, if I think we need to emphasize the frequency of our steps a little bit more, I may move it back to 11 and a half. So it's a, it's a little variability there. But, but if you use 12 and a half to, 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 excuse me, 11 and a half to 12 meters, they can run right through that hurdle just like they would in a three-step. And then the 8.2. Then 8.2. 8.2. So typically the height on these first couple of hurdles, I may leave them at 33, but then when I get to the eight step, to the three steps, I drop them to 30. This, this exercise takes a little bit of adaptation, a little bit of courage, because it's a little scary the first time you come off that five-stepper and go to a three-step. You feel like, where's the ripcord? I want to bail out of here. Okay. 
But this is, this, this is an exercise or something like this can be utilized to challenge what you're doing. So again, I, I'll keep records on this. Uh, look at the times. The, the time circle in the blue are the five-step touchdowns. I want them somewhere in the 130s if I can get them. And this is what I'm looking for. 92, 93, 93, 94. Okay, the, the, the athletes has adapted that high velocity and now they're taking it with three steps. And so what they're doing is kinesthetically they're experiencing what it's like to run between the hurdles in 0.93 seconds and to get comfortable doing that. We want to, so basically it's like you would do with a flat sprinter in their fly work. You're trying to improve their maximum velocity. And then, of course, keeping touchdown, competition touchdown times, I think is important because it's the, the, the great thing about the hurdle event is we can go back and with our touchdowns and we can really analyze what happened in the race. You know, if I, if I typically see touchdowns starting to get too, too long late in the race, I know one of two things happened. One, our fitness isn't very good, but more than likely we got too close to the hurdle. Okay, nice string here, 95, 97, 98, 97, moving real fast, and all of a sudden, maybe we had a misstep here. We got too close to the hurdle. Well, we had to back off, 103, 109. So keeping those kinds of records is a good thing. And then that's, that's just another chart with touchdowns, cumulative touchdown, the velocities, and a, a curve of what the... Typical race looks like. Typical velocity curve. I made it. I made it. <laughs> Questions? The great thing about the, this, this event is it's, it's open to so much imagination in terms of what you can do to, to challenge your athletes. And, and uh, it is very individualized, though. Did you make all the templates for your charts and stuff? Yeah, it's, they, these come out of a software program that I use to keep track of all the stuff and all my training. So I just took some pictures of it. The name of the program? I'm sorry? The name of the program? Uh, training Design Pro. I'm the, I'm the author of it, so okay. <laughs> if you're interested in it, you can contact me. I'm sorry, your question in the back? Well, I just wondering, um, you know what's the, the penultimate drill? So for long jump, it's similar, but what I saw was Perdita, her hips are going forward Mm -hmm. And then with long jumpers, the hips are going. I mean, that, that's a difference. Right. A it, it would be a little different with the long jumper because obviously the long jumper, they want to raise their center mass a little bit more. You've got a little bit more air time. Right. So, yeah, but, but I use the same exercise with my long jumpers to help them with their penultimate step. Okay. But yeah. That's what it seems. It's a similar drill. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. With a long jumper, when you look at that takeoff position with the knees, you're, pro you're not going to see that knee ahead. You're typically going to see it even and maybe even a little bit behind. But it's, it's just, I always take a look at the, uh, with a high jumper, you're going to see the foot out more and farther in front of the center mass, long jump, hurdles, and sprints more underneath you. So it's kind of a continuum there. But yeah, I, I use the same exercise with my, high, with my long jumpers to help them set up their penultimate step. Because really, at, it's, it's just as critical there. The penultimate step is, is where you transfer your energy into the takeoff. And so many long jumpers kill, kill that energy on their penultimate step rather than create it. No questions? All right. I guess that's it, Derek. Thank you very much, Derek.